Uh, IPT hasn't always been called IPT. In fact, that name came about, I think, uh, sometime after Dr. Ayer uh, kind of brought IPT out of Mexico into the U.S. Um, Dr. Stephen Ayer is a, a Canadian, was a Canadian. He's passed away now. Wonderful man. Um, he uh, was a Canadian physician uh, living in the United States, and he became friends with uh, uh, the Donatos, um, this is the lineage of doctors who discovered IPT. And uh, he worked with them very closely for years and they finally brought it to the U.S. I guess in the really late 90s. And, um, uh, and then there was a group of us who got involved early, early, early in those days. Um, and now it's grown to be quite a phenomenon. There's actually two different societies for it. There's one in Europe and one in the U.S. Um, uh, the interesting thing is, is that Dr. Donato the, the first was um, discovered this method way back about, about five years after insulin was discovered. I think insulin was discovered in either 1931 or 32, and uh, he started to use this as a, as a therapeutic, uh, as a biological response modifier, insulin, uh, in about 1936. And I think the first cancer case was actually treated successfully in 1943. Um, I don't know. Those are approximate dates, but anyway, it's based on very sound, um, sound science, um, and it's interesting that IPT predates chemotherapy, because in the first days, when 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 it was first used, it was used to treat tertiary syphilis, which is syphilis that gets into the brain, and they didn't have any uh, really sophisticated poisons in those days, so they used low doses of mercury and arsenic uh, after um, after giving the insulin. So we knew then that it actually crosses the blood-brain barrier, which is a very good thing to know. And then actually um, Donato II did the same kind of work in, <clears throat> in the 50s with uh, polio. So again, crossed the blood-brain barrier to get into the, to the spine. So um, very effective treatment. So but basically in, in cancer, what's happening is that cancer cells are, are cells that have changed in many ways because they are uh, fermenting cells. And fermenting cells have different requirements. And one is they need a lot of glucose. In fact, they need 19 times more glucose. So in order to get more glucose, they have upregulated up certain enzymes, um, the glucosidases, and, uh, but uh, also um, insulin receptors. So cancer cells have many, many, many more insulin receptors. So when you go to sleep at night and uh, you're not eating, hopefully, wake up in the morning and have something sweet, uh, sugar rises, pancreas puts out insulin, cancer cells grab it first, and they eat first. So this is a mechanism for cancer survival. It kind of gets the food first because it's got more insulin receptors, because it needs 19 times more glucose than, than healthy cells. So <clears throat> anyway, knowing this about it, knowing that this is a normal part of cancer's biochemistry, cancer's cellular physiology, knowing that we can use it as a therapeutic tool. It's been used by the conventional world uh, as a um, um, diagnostic tool. That's what a PET scan is. In a PET scan, they inject fluorodeoxyglucose, which is a radioactive glucose. They wait an hour, and then they scan you. And wherever there's a rapid uptake of glucose, they can identify that as a focus of cancer. You know, the liver, the bone, whatever. Because uh, above a certain threshold, uh, only cancer would be, re be consuming sugar at that rate, glucose at that rate. So here we, you know, understanding that cancer has this requirement is used as a diagnostic tool, but uh, to take it one step further, let's use it as a therapeutic tool and use it as kind of a, a Trojan horse. And so what we do is, you know, you, you, you use the, uh, the person comes in uh, ha not having eaten since the night before and um, uh, is given a certain amount of insulin, a calculation based on body weight, uh, just enough to, uh, it's about the same amount used in a, in a um, uh, when you, the same amount of insulin that someone would secrete during a normal meal. It's not a large amount. And the goal is not to make someone hypoglycemic and, and sick. That's not the goal. The goal is to open up cancer cells. That's the goal. And why are we going to open them up? Because they have more insulin receptors and they will be saturated first. So there's a, there's a window, there's a period of time between when all the cancer cells get saturated because they have the more receptors than when the rest of the cells do. And that is called the therapeutic window, therapeutic moment. And there's a little period of time and that's when the drugs are administered. And so 
that's usually between 20 and 40 minutes, depending on the person. You know, a lot of it depends on a person's um, um, condition when they come in. Uh, if someone's insulin resistant, etc. But um, you got to remember, um, even though the cancer cells, I mean, even though the healthy cells may be insulin resistant, the cancer cells aren't. That's what they depend on. So they're not insulin resistant. So anyway, anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes after getting the insulin is the time that uh, you may or may not begin to get some symptoms of hypoglycemia, but nobody ever gets, we don't allow anyone to get hypoglycemic and get sick. <clears throat> very well-trained nurses, uh, very well-trained physicians. It's something that we watch very carefully. We've all had ER training. We know what it looks like. And anyway, that's not the goal. The goal is just to saturate the cancer cells. So it's a very simple thing. Um, there's never been in, in, one death in the world from um, IPT. Um, now, can't say that for other therapies. But in any case, then there is that therapeutic window, the time where you administer the, the chemos and some of the other things, some uh, antibiotics, antimicrobials. And then you re uh, you're done, you reverse it by eating. Usually you can eat something which will bring up your, your sugar, which closes off all the whole insulin cascade. Uh, the way, just real quickly, um, the way insulin um, allows a chemo to get in is that insulin, um, when insulin binds to an insulin receptor, one of the enzymes is activated is called delta-9 desaturase, which changes the fatty acid um, composition of the cell membrane from stearic acid to oleic acid. Um, and uh, oleic acid is a liquid at body temperature, whereas stearic acid is a solid at body temperature. So in effect, what it's done, the insulin binding to the insulin receptor, is made the membrane permeable. So now whatever's in the environment, arsenic, uh, mercury, like they used way back when, uh, or now cisplatin, carbotaxin, whatever, carboplatin, any of the taxanes, any adriamycin, any chemo, whatever's in there will, be, will get through uh, uh, more readily. And there are other mechanisms that are proposed too. Not everyone understands all the mechanisms. But what we do know is that a small amount, a 10% dose of the chemo, gets to the target and not the collateral damage is minimal. So we don't see people losing their hair. We don't see all the other horrible side effects that you get from chemo. So we get the benefits of it without all the horrible side effects. And we don't use it with everybody all the time. We use it in certain situations when it's necessary and um, um, uh, because there are many other ways of working with cancer that are very important. But it is an incredibly useful tool. And, um, so we've been using it now for about uh, 14, 15 years. This has been my experience.